Let me encourage you to open your Bibles to Mark, Mark's Gospel, the second Gospel in the New Testament, second writing in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and uh, the first chapter. You know, the last, as Jeff was talking and praying, the last uh, 21 Sundays, uh, we worked our way through the entire Old Testament. Uh, we jumped ahead at Christmas time and we read the chapter in that book, The Story on the nativity, and we read the verses from the Bible that have to do with the birth of Jesus, and then we picked up the Old Testament. We've gone from creation to the flood, Tower of Babel, uh, the calling of Abraham, the formation of Israel, the exodus out of Egypt, the wanderings in the wilderness, crossing uh, the uh, the river into the promised land, uh, the, the time of the judges, the period of the judges lasted 120 to 150 years, and then you have the... Uh, uh, formation of the monarchy, and then the dividing of the two kingdoms, uh, Israel to the north, Judah to the south, Israel falls to the Assyrians, and eventually Judah falls to the Babylonians. There are 70 years of exile in Babylon, and the Persians conquer the Babylonians and send the Jews back to Israel, and 50,000 Jews come back to Israel and to Jerusalem, and they rebuild the temple, and they rebuild the walls. And there's the ministry of the prophets during all of that time. And there's the ministry of of the wisdom literature. And then there's about 400 years of silence. And they don't hear from God. And there's no prophet that stands in Israel during those 400 years after Malachi to say, Thus saith the Lord, until one night a star shines over Bethlehem. And angels are singing to shepherds and a little baby is born in a stable. And the world changes. And that's where we pick up last week, the ministry of Jesus. And uh, John preached on the baptism of, of Jesus at the hands of John the Baptist. Uh, I preached on, on one of the early episodes in the ministry of Jesus, the, uh, the interview with the woman at the well. Today I want us to focus on what was the focus of Jesus' ministry. If we're going to talk about the ministry of Jesus, I'd like for us to center in on the hot focus of his preaching and his teaching and his miracles and his parables. And, and uh, we'll find that in Mark's gospel. So let's stand and honor the reading of God's word. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. Mark records, And it came about in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. <clears throat> And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out of the heavens. Thou art my beloved son in thee. I'm well pleased. And immediately, by by the way, when you're taking your your, uh, what we call baby Greek uh, in seminary, Mark's gospel is is probably the simplest Greek of the New Testament. So nearly all Greek students begin translating Mark's gospel. And one of the words you learn right off the bat is that word immediately. Heathus in the Greek. Look at verse 10. And immediately. Verse 12. And immediately. Verse 18. Immediately. Verse 20. Immediately. Verse 28. Immediately. Verse 29. Immediately. Verse 20. Simon's brother-in-law was lying sick with a fever. And immediately. John, uh, excuse me, Mark is writing to the Romans. And Romans were people of action. And John picks up with the action. John Mark. Mark picks up with the action of Jesus. It is immediately, immediately things are happening. He doesn't talk about the nativity. He doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus. Doesn't give Jesus ancestry. Because the Romans didn't care about your pedigree. They wanted to know, can you get the job done? And that's what Mark does in his writing. He jumps into the action of Jesus right off the bat. So verse 12 says, And immediately, right after his baptism, the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels were ministering to him. And after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. May God add his richest blessings to the reading of this, his word. And may his Holy Spirit apply the preaching and teaching of his word to our hearts and to our lives this day. Please be seated. 
Are you familiar with the phrase, all in? I was watching, when I watch TV, I usually watch the sports channels, and uh, I'm not sure why it's on the sports channel, but they were televising a card game, a professional card game. High stakes, evidently. The announcers weren't talking like I'm talking. They were talking like this. Had I not been watching it, I would, if I'd just been listening, I would have thought I was listening to a golf broadcast because they were being very quiet. And evidently, it was a big moment, an intense moment. It, the card game was down to just two players. And one of the players was doing this with his hands. And I don't think it was the fact that he was nervous. I think this is just his, his quirk. This is just something this guy did. And then all of a sudden he stopped and he shoved all of his chips out into the middle of the table. And there was this collective gasp in the room. And the, the commentator says, oh my, he's all in. Well, you know what that means in a card game. It means you're betting that, that you've got the best hand and you're so sure that you do. You're going to give it your all. That's what it means. It means you, you, you are sold out completely to this hand. That's what it means. And we Baptists, we don't know a lot about Card game. So that's why I'm trying to explain this to you. We know a lot about dominoes. We just don't know a lot about cards. If you're a cliff diver or a parachutist or a bungee jumper, you know what it means to be all in. The moment you jump out of that plane or you shove off from that platform or the moment that you let gravity just take over and you fall from the bridge... You're all in. An astronaut knows what it be, means to be all in. When you're strapped into that small cone, that little capsule at the top of a, a huge rocket that's filled with, with tons and tons of highly flammable uh, rocket fuel, and you hear those words, three, two, one, ignition, lift off, and, and the rocket begins to shake. At that moment, the astronaut, be it a man, be it a woman, they're all in. If you're a business person, you know what it means to be all in. When you've invested your last penny, your last dime, your last dollar in that project or that business that you've been dreaming about your whole life, you're all in. All in financially, all in emotionally, all in physically, all in mentally, all in relationally, sometimes all in spiritually. We know what that means. But what does it mean to be all in for Jesus Christ? As a follower, as a disciple of Jesus, what is it to be all in? Well, as always, we turn to Jesus as our example, and he doesn't disappoint. From the earliest descriptions of Jesus after his birth, it's found there in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. The scripture says that Jesus, age 12, he grew in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God, in favor with man. Jesus had committed himself fully to following God's plan for his life. He was all in intellectually, all in physically, all in spiritually, and all in socially. No part of his being as a young man or as a mature adult was neglected or uncommitted to the Father. Jesus was all in. Now, in the New Testament, those four documents that tell the story of Jesus Birth, Jesus' life, Jesus' ministry, his death and his resurrection. We call them the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the good news of Jesus. But Mark's is the basic Gospel. Mark's is the, the, the uh, succinct Gospel. Most scholars believe that Mark's was the first Gospel written and that Matthew and Luke take their lead from what Mark had written. And Mark's gospel, as we said a moment ago, is a, is a gospel of action. He does not give the birth narratives as Matthew and Luke do. He doesn't take us back to explain in the very beginning that Jesus was the pre-existent word of God. He simply begins with the action and the ministry of Jesus. The camera zooms in in chapter 1 immediately on John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness and baptizing at the Jordan. And by verse 9, Jesus has already taken center stage. Mark covers the baptism of Jesus in just three verses. The wilderness temptation in just two verses. And then in verses 14 and 15, he begins with the ministry of Jesus. There again, it says, after John, speaking of the Baptist, has been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. 
The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. The time is at hand. The time is fulfilled. That word time, the Greeks had two words for time. Two words for time. One was the word chronos. It's where we get our word chronology. It speaks of of calendar time. Time moving from the past to the present and to the future. And it's the picture of father time. He's stooped over and he's, he's got his black robe on and his cane and he's moving forward ever so slowly, but he is moving forward. That's chronos, chronology. The other word the Greeks used for time was the word kairos. That word speaks of special time, opportunity time. And the picture they had in their mind of kairos was not this old stooped over father time, but a fleet footed youth with wings on his sandals. And he's not wearing a robe. He's stripped down for the race. And his head is completely shaved. It's completely bald except for one lock of hair on his forehead. And the idea is when this Kairos comes by you, when this opportunity is going by, if you don't grab him while he's right in front of you, once he's past you, there's nothing to hold on to. He's gone and you've missed it. You forfeited that opportunity. Jesus is saying the time has come. An incredible opportunity is before you. This is a special moment in history. It's a time to be all in. If I was a first century seeker, if I, if I were hearing this for the first time, I want to ask Jesus, all in for what? What is it that you're calling us to be committed to? What is it that we are being asked to be involved in? What's this can't miss opportunity that you're talking about? Well, he explains that in the very next phrase. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is here. The time has come, Jesus declared, for God's kingdom to be established on this earth. And that's what the ministry of Jesus was all about. The the keynote of the preaching of Jesus And the ministry of Jesus is none other than the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Parable after parable that Jesus told is about the kingdom. How often he began his parables by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. Sermon after sermon is about how life is to be lived in the kingdom of God as citizens of that kingdom. Miracle after miracle was performed to give us a preview of the joy and the wholeness that awaits those who are part of God's kingdom. On virtually every page of the Gospels, Jesus is revealing some aspect of the kingdom to his disciples and to us. So that begs the question, if the kingdom is central to Jesus' life and Jesus' work, if it was the hot focus of his preaching and his ministry, then we do best to do our best to understand what the kingdom is and what the kingdom is not and what the New Testament has to say about it. The kingdom of heaven, first of all, is not a group of people, which means the kingdom is not the church. I had someone come to me after the early service and say, I thought the kingdom was the church. I thought we are the kingdom of God. Pioneer Drive is is the kingdom. No, the church is not the kingdom. Churches die. I can take you to places in Abilene where there used to be churches and they're not churches anymore. I can take you to liquor stores in parts of Texas that used to be churches and now they're liquor stores. The kingdom is bigger than any church. The kingdom of God is bigger than the church. Now, the church is an outpost of the kingdom. Yesterday, my wife gave up. With some of her friends gave some of you ladies uh, a a shower for a a bride to be. And it was at our house from one to three, one to three prime time for basketball on TV on Saturday. And my wife's given a shower. So I did what any good husband would do. I drove to San Angelo. (laughs) As I was driving to San Angelo, I passed on 277 South Fort Chadburn, Fort Chadburn. That, at one time, was an outpost of the U.S. Army back in the 19th century. It was an outpost of the United States government out on the frontier, out on the prairie. 
It was not the government. It was not the army. But it was a manifestation of the army. Pioneer Drive Baptist Church is not the kingdom of God, but we are a manifestation of the kingdom of God. We're an outpost of the kingdom doing the work of the kingdom, but we are not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not a geographical place on the map. You can't lay out a map or or look at a globe and point to one place and say, now there's the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God in people's lives. The kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God in people's hearts and in people's lives. Now you say, well, that's a great definition, but where does that come from? I don't remember that as a scripture in the Bible. Oh, it's there. And it comes from Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, which is kind of like the Constitution for the kingdom of God, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus describes what the kingdom is to be like. And he describes what we as kingdom citizens are to be like. He gives us the ethics of the kingdom and the principles that we're to follow as kingdom citizens. And in the sixth chapter, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, now this is how kingdom citizens are to pray. And the very first petition that we are to pray is this, thy kingdom come. Jesus says, Father, may thy kingdom come. What does that mean? Well, using a very common literary device of his day called Hebrew parallelism, where the second line amplifies and defines the meaning of the first, Jesus tells us what he means by the kingdom. Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? It means thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wherever people are doing The will of God. Wherever people are sold out, all in for the kingdom of God, doing the will of God, submitting their lives to the sovereign rule of God, there is the kingdom of God. So when Jesus arrives on the scene in Mark chapter 1 with the announcement, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, he is declaring to the world that the sovereign will, the sovereign rule of God is now here. It's incarnated. It's embodied in the person of God's Son. The time to be all in, Jesus says, is now. And it's not an individual thing. It's not merely a church thing. It's not a Baptist General Convention of Texas thing. It's a kingdom thing. Christianity from the get-go was first and foremost a kingdom movement. And it must be today. So what does the New Testament teach us about the kingdom? If that's the hot focus of Jesus' ministry, I think it's would be good if we understood what this ministry that we're going to be studying the next few weeks is all about. So if you're taking notes, as I'd encourage you to do, I'm going to give you seven things about the kingdom of God. And you're going, oh, no, he usually gives us three. We're going to be here till it's 80 degrees. No, we're going to be short. We're going to be brief on these. But you may want to write these down. First of all, the kingdom of God is not something we establish. Kingdom of God is not something that we build. We make it happen. At least 14 different verb forms are employed in the New Testament with reference to the kingdom of God. And never does it say that we build the kingdom. Mark says that we receive the kingdom. Luke says we enter into the kingdom. Uh, Matthew says we are to proclaim the kingdom. But nowhere does the New Testament speak of you and I building the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is God's sovereign rule in people's lives. And only God can bring that about. So it's not something that we build. Secondly, the kingdom of God or God's sovereign rule has come into history in the person of Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus cast the demon out of a person and his critics, the religious rulers of the day, accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. And he just laughs. He says, are you nuts? Why would even Satan smarter than that? Satan would not cast out his own workers. By his power. That means he would be fighting against himself. Then in verse 20 he says, But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon us. The kingdom of God is here. 
The establishment of God's kingdom on earth is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. By his sinless life, by his vicarious substitutionary death on the cross, by his glorious resurrection, Jesus has established the sovereign rule of God on earth. And even though not all people at this time are yielding to God's sovereign rule, that does not mean that the kingdom has not come. There are a lot of folks that don't obey the laws of our land. That doesn't change the fact that they are still the laws of our lands. There are some folks who have said, he's not my president. That doesn't change the fact that whoever's president is president. And just because not everybody yields to the kingdom doesn't mean that God's kingdom has not arrived. It has been established in history through the person of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, the kingdom of God, though initially small, will eventually be acknowledged throughout the whole earth. Jesus teaches this again and again, especially in his parables. In the 13th chapter of Luke, Jesus gives the parable of the mustard seed. And he says, what is the kingdom of God like and to what shall I compare it? He says, it's like a mustard seed, which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. The kingdom of God, small in its beginning, baby in a manger, but eventually it becomes huge in its influence, huge in in the way that it eventually impacts the world. This is the promise of God. It's presented by John at the end of the Bible. When in Revelation chapter 11, John says the day is coming where the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and forever. Sometimes it does seem as though the powers of evil are prevailing. Hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But the promise of God's word is that the kingdom of God has been established And that however faint its influence appears to be now, there will come that day, that moment in history, when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the promise of God's word. The kingdom will eventually be acknowledged in all the earth. Fourth, the kingdom of God is open to all people. It is open to all people. When Jesus was just an infant... Mary and Joseph brought him into the temple to be dedicated to God. And, and they, they hand him into the arms or they place him in the arms of an aged saint whose name was Simeon. Simeon was a priest and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he saw the Lord's Christ, the Lord's anointed. And somehow by the Spirit of God revealing it to him, when he took the baby Jesus in his arm, old Simeon knew, this is, this is, this is the one. This is the Messiah. And he holds him up and he blesses God and he says, not only is this child to be the glory of God's people, the glory of Israel, but he is also to become the light of revelation to the Gentiles. Simeon, in doing this, was reminding Judaism of his day that from the very beginning, God's purpose was to share his grace, not just with one ethnic group, the Jews alone, but with every tribe and every tongue and every nation on earth. And any person can come under the sovereign rule of God and become a part of God's eternal kingdom. That's the whosoever will of the gospel. The kingdom of God is open to all people. Fifth, the kingdom of God is different from every other kingdom. There's no kingdom like it. Jesus said to Pilate during the time of his scourging and the mockery of the trial, my kingdom is not of this world. He was underscoring the truth that in the kingdom of God, there's a different set of values that govern. A different set of principles that rule our lives. The kingdoms of this world are marked by ostentatious displays of wealth. Ruthless demonstrations of power. Meticulous attention is given to status and position. But in the kingdom of God... What marks the kingdom is mercy and gentleness and kindness and generosity, love and forgiveness. In the kingdom of God, a man is not considered to be great by the number of people who serve him. He's considered to be great by the number of people he or she gladly serve. 
It's completely different. I, I love the way Philip Yancey, a popular writer, puts it in one of his books. He says, a society that welcomes people of all races and social classes, that is characterized by love, and not polarization, that cares most for its weakest members, that stands for justice and righteousness in a world enamored with selfishness and decadence, a society in which members compete for the privilege of serving one another. That's what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is radically different than all the other kingdoms of the world. Sixth, Jesus is the king of this new kingdom. Every kingdom has a king, and Jesus is the king of the kingdom of God. The enemies of Jesus hurled this complaint against his disciples in the, in the, in the town of Thessalonica as Christianity was spreading into Europe. It went into Greece, and in Thessalonica, the enemies of, of Christ went to the authorities, and they complained. They said, these followers of the Galilean, they're all defying Caesar's decrees. They're saying there is another king, one called Jesus. And they were absolutely right. There is another king. There is another Lord. There is another sovereign. It's King Jesus. King Jesus, designated not with a crown, but with a cross. King Jesus, conquering not the armies of Rome, but the powers of sin and death and hell and Satan himself. King Jesus, whose claim to sovereignty and deity is not vindicated by popular acclaim, is not determined by the vote of the majority, but by God's action of raising his obedient son from the grave that he might be seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. Teresa of Avila, a mystic of the 16th century, would always address Jesus as your majesty. She understood there's another king. And we would do well to follow her example. There is a king who rules eternally over the kingdom of God. And it is his majesty, the Lord Jesus Christ. One final truth regarding this kingdom. To recognize the true king is to give him your full and total allegiance. Your full and total allegiance. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus is describing how kingdom citizens live, he says that no man can serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other, or you're hold to the one and you will despise the other. But you can't serve two masters. To recognize Christ as your king means that you pledge your full and total allegiance to him and to him alone. That's the essence of the kingdom of God. It is the sovereign rule of God established on earth by Jesus. Activated when we submit our lives in faith to him. And it results in a new ethic, a new way of living, a new way of loving, a whole new way of looking at life, a life that demands our total allegiance to him. Any person can become a part of that kingdom. When you recognize and surrender your will to Christ as king of your life, when you choose to live under the sovereign rule of God, you become a part of something bigger than your family, something bigger than this church, something bigger than this nation, something bigger than your dreams. You become a part of the eternal kingdom of God. When Jesus taught the disciples to pray, he placed right in the heart of that prayer that powerful petition Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That prayer is a request for God to manifest his sovereignty and his power on earth, just like his sovereignty reigns in heaven. And that should be the request of every man, woman, boy, or girl who through Jesus Christ has become a citizen of the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Bobby Richardson, the second baseman of the New York Yankees back in the day. And he prayed a, a very brief but poignant prayer at a Fellowship of Christian Athletes gathering. He prayed, dear Lord, your will, nothing less, nothing more, 
nothing else. The kingdom of God is whenever and wherever you and I are all in for his sovereign rule. That's the reason Jesus came. It was to establish the kingdom of God in your life and in mine. Would you stand with me? And let's bow together and let's pray together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father... Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of commitment this morning is the hymn, I Surrender All. I think it's appropriate that Danny has selected that hymn. We've talked about this before. In the world, when you surrender, that means you lose. You're declaring, I've lost. But when you surrender your life to Christ and to God's sovereign will, it means you win. It's just the opposite. It's the greatest day of your life, not the worst. And from that moment on, it's a process of turning over parts of your life to Christ. You know, in Texas, we have these huge ranches that are measured not just by acres, but by sections of land. 640 acres in a section. The Christian life is a little bit like taking Jesus with you everywhere you go. And he'll point out this section and he says, you know, you haven't really given this to me yet. Oh, you... You, you wanted this part of my life too? Yes. And you yield that to him. And then there's another section and then another. And it's just until at the, we get to that place where we are being conformed to the image of Jesus more and more, day by day. And the goal is that when he calls us home and we walk through the gates of heaven and we pass down the corridor to the throne room to see Jesus and the angels are lining that corridor that they look at you and they step back in wonder and say, oh my goodness, look how much like Jesus she looks. Look how much like Jesus he looks. And it begins when you say yes to Christ. I want to be a part of your kingdom. I yield my will to yours, your sovereign will in my life. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life on earth as it is in heaven. Maybe you have a commitment that you need to make public this morning for Christ. Charlene Smith came this morning from First Baptist Church of Graham, Texas. She's moved to Abilene. She needed a church family, a church home, and God led her here. Maybe God has led you to Pioneer Drive, and you want to become a part of our church today. Maybe you want to bow to King Jesus and say, for the first time in my life, I'm opening my life to Christ, and I'm receiving him as my Lord and Savior. We rejoice with you in that decision. Or maybe God's been leading you to some new place of service or ministry or some task and and it's been a struggle but you're saying yes to him but you need the church to encourage you and stand with you we'd love to do that however god might be leading jeff will be here i'll be here more importantly the lord is waiting you come as we sing together i surrender all